All right, this morning we are excited. I'm excited. Uh, we are going to finish up our series uh, designed for purpose. Um, this is a sensitive topic for some people, but that's okay because you guys are big, grown up, big boy, big girl people. So we're going to talk about some things this morning that are uh, heavy on my heart as well as I, I believe a lot of other people's hearts. So we're going to be talking about salt and light this morning. So if you guys wouldn't mind turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, um, maybe not chronologically speaking the first, but uh, we can debate that later. If you don't know where the book of Matthew is, there is a table of context in your Bibles, and it's okay to use that. Once you find Matthew 5, we're going to start in verse 13. If you wouldn't mind uh, to stand as we read God's Word in respect of God's Word. So Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city is, that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this morning, this wonderful morning where we get to have the privilege of coming before you and worshiping at your feet. Lord, I pray this morning as we do this, Lord, that you would be here with us. Lord, whether we're watching from home or whether we're in this room or Lord, whether it's Tuesday night and we're just watching this sermon for the first time, I pray that your presence would be here and that our hearts would be soft to what you have to say to us. I pray that we would not leave this building or leave this time with you the same. I pray that we would be changed for your glory. We love you, and we thank you. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. So this entire sermon series, we've been talking about what your purpose is for being here, what your purpose is as far as what God has called us to do as people, as far as what kind of situations have been, we have been put in, or Old Testament people have been put in, that God was able to use for His glory, for His good, for His purposes. So the reason why we are designed for purpose is because God has a purpose for us. I know that that sounds like circular reasoning, but go with me on this. We Christians are the salt of the earth. Jesus says it right here. It's interesting, Jesus doesn't tell us that we become the salt of the earth or that we learn how to be the salt of the earth. He says, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as people who proclaim his name, we are the salt of the earth. In the same way, we are the light in a dark world. Sometimes we lose our flavor or our light starts to dim, but why is that and how can we stop it? More importantly, what will it take to change and positively affect those around us? Uh, get what I said there? Positive, if you know anything about salt. Po anyway, okay. Uh, so, guys, <laughs> moving on, sorry. We want to be talking this morning about why G Jesus uses these terms, salt and light. And so, first, we're going to be talking about salt. So, salt is primarily, in our culture, used as flavor for... Uh, food. If you're from Utah, I don't know if they do this in, in uh, Canada as much, but in Utah, during the wintertime, they use salt on the roads, uh, which just causes the rust in your car to get super awesome. Uh, but, but guys, back in these days, it wouldn't have been really used for flavor of food as much. It was still used, but they also used it as a preservative, specifically for meat. They would rub their meat good down with salt, and then that would keep the meat for longer periods of time. It would kill the bacteria and keep the bacteria off of the meat. So salt was a preservative. And specifically when Jesus is talking, he's talking about us being the preservative in this world. And so we need to look at why Jesus calls us salt. Uh, we are to be the preservative that holds our community and those around us from getting rotten and deteriorated. It's not that hard of a jump to look at what's going on in our world around us and know that as Christians, we can see the writing on the walls of what's going on in our world right now. We can see how things are going badly. <laughs> 
But guys, we have the Bible, and that tell, the Bible kind of gives us the end story. Things are going to get much worse before they get any better. So, so guys, don't get surprised when we see things going bad. We are, though, the preservative in the community. We as the church are the only thing that can help this world come away from the terrible places that it is headed. So we become the voices of reason. We become the people who are pointing people to the right way, not the way of the world. There's, there's two paths that we can take in this world, and that is the path towards Jesus Christ and the path towards destruction. That's it, guys. There's not a million ways to God. There's one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Chuck Smith says it like this. It's, uh, I love this quote. Uh, Christianity, wherever it has gone, has been a preserving influence in that society. Wherever there is a, a strong Christian emphasis and a strong Christian voice, that society is being preserved and maintained. But whenever the Christian voice begins to wane, that society begins to deteriorate and ultimately be destroyed. So guys, we in this particular community in Winkler, Manitoba, we live in a very strong Christian-influenced community. I don't know if you guys realize that. Um, from an outsider's perspective, I am shocked that Walmart is closed on a Sunday. I have never been in a place where a Walmart will close on a Sunday. <laughs> and so, guys, that's that Christian influence in this community. I, I hate to break it to you, Walmart in other areas stays open on Sunday. Most businesses stay open on Sunday, and so to have a place that is closed down on Sunday, let alone not just Walmart, we've got Staples and Shoppers and all of the business, Canadian Tire, they all shut down on Sundays, and that is weird. <laughs> it was one of the biggest cultural adjustments that my wife and I had to make was needing to remember that on Sunday we can't go to the store really quick to get something. Like, we need to prepare on Saturday. For those kinds of things. And so guys, understand that that's largely due to the Christian influence in this community that we have currently, which is an amazing thing. But guys, outside of this bubble, as it were, here in Winkler, the world is going downhill quickly. And I know that you guys know that, and I, I know that you see it on a daily basis. If you watch any kind of news or read any kind of news, you know that things are not going well in this world. And so we need to be the preservative. We need to be that voice. I love the fact that Walmart is closed on Sunday because I think it should be a thing. I love that fact. I love the fact that we live in a community where I don't have to be afraid of talking about God. I don't have to, I don't have to shy away from who I am as a Christian. But guys, I want us to know that that's because of the Christian influence, not, not in spite of it. And so, guys, we want to continue on in that path of being the preservative to this world. Uh, we are to be the preserving influence uh, the question becomes then, how are we to be that Christian influence? And 1 Corinthians one twenty three says it this way. Uh, Paul is talking and he says, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles, fool Gentiles foolishness. Uh, Jesus and his sacrifice are the only things that we should be concerned about in this world. We know nothing else. As uh, 1 Corinthians 2.2 2 says the same thing, essentially, we don't know anything if it isn't for Christ and him, him crucified. And so being the salt in this earth means that we go forward and we preach Christ and Him crucified. There's nothing else that we should be thinking or doing or everything in our being should be Christ and Him crucified. And if it's not, guys, then we're going to start losing our influence. We're going to start losing our influence, and I want to talk about that in depth. I'm going to hold off as long as I can without talking about it in depth, though, because that's the part of this morning that gives me anxiety. You know what? No, we're just going to do it. <laughs> there, there are so many Christians, and guys, I'm going to say this, present company not excluded, that use our platform on social media or use our platform in the community or use whatever we have to preach our opinions about how the government is doing or about what we feel about masks or what we how we feel about COVID shutdowns or how we feel about Trudeau or Trump or, or Hillary or any of these things or gun laws or whatever it is. Guys, that is not the reason why we are here. That is not the purpose that we have been given. We have been given the purpose to preach Christ and Him crucified. Nothing else. Oh, something just fell. That's, that's weird. 
Sorry, guys. We have this attitude that's contrary to what the Bible points to in that we are to be humbly serving not just Jesus Christ, but our community, our fellow believers, our, our brothers and sisters, and let's not forget this, our enemies. We are to love our enemies. We are to pray for our enemies, those who we disagree with, those who we don't like. The idea is not just that we would pray for them, that they would wake up and get right, which, guys, I'm guilty of all the time of saying, stop being stupid and and start believing what I believe. Guys, we are not to pray like that. We are to pray in hopes that they are right. We are to pray in hopes that that person that's wearing a mask that we think is ridiculous is actually correct in their thinking that they should be wearing a mask. We are to hope that they have the right attitude and that we, our hearts, my heart, my personal opinion can be changed in this. Not that I would be able to yell at them and convince them that they're an idiot and they go, oh yeah, you're right, you know, and they take the mask off. Guys, that's not my purpose. My purpose is Christ and Him crucified. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things, this is important, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Matthew twenty twenty eight says, Just as the Son of Men did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Guys, my purpose here is not to glorify my opinion, political or otherwise. My purpose here in in glorifying Jesus Christ is not to get my own glory. Even in Matthew, in our our scripture here, verse 16 says, "Let let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. My good works, my doing anything is not for my glory. It is not for me. It's for God. So let me ask you this, and this is going to be a convicting question, I think, for a lot of us. When we post on Facebook, when we tweet out whatever we tweet and whenever we Instagram, whatever we Instagram, are we glorifying God or are we trying to glorify ourselves and our own opinion? I've said it on this stage many times, and I've said it to most of you multiple times. How many opinions does a dead man have? None. And so, as, as a person that is supposed to be dead to self and alive in Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that means that my opinions don't matter. It's Christ and Him crucified. Many of you guys have a platform to speak on in social media. Fantastic. What are you using that platform to do? Are you using it to glorify Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Or are you using it to browbeat people into your way of politically thinking? Or are you using it to take pictures of a, a, of a burrito that was really good? I mean, that's probably fine. I don't, I don't mind the burrito. <laughs> but look, social media in the hands of the right person is an amazing tool. I think of the dean of my Bible college that I graduated from. Guys, he posts every couple of days. I I shared a post of his so you guys can go find it on my Facebook page if you want to find this guy. But he absolutely never posts anything personal, anything else. Like, and if he does, it's a story that leads into how to glorify Jesus Christ better. That's what he uses his social media platform. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, he's a dean of a Bible college. Yeah, so what? He's also a Christian man. And my Christian walk, I want it to resemble what Jesus Christ would be doing. And I have a hard time believing that Jesus Christ would be posting some of the things that I and you guys have posted in the past. And so we need to be careful on what we do, how we use our platform, because social media in the wrong hands can be something that is terrible. Social media in the wrong hands can, can be, it can become a breeding ground for personal attacks on others based on their political stance, that could, uh, their COVID stance, their opinion of what toilet paper to use. Guys, it doesn't matter what we post on there except for people are watching us. People watch Christians, guys. If you don't think it's true, like just ask your friends if they believe that you're a Christian or not, what they see in you. They're watching you. They watch you to see if what you do is hypocritical. They watch you to see if if what you say you believe is true, 
is true in your life. The saying is somewhat true that, that you could be the only Bible that a person ever reads, right? The idea of your daily walk with the Lord, guys, people are watching you. They're reading you. They're, they're looking at how you act and how you talk and how you present this person that you believe has saved you from an eternity of punishment and destruction. Guys, if we truly believe that Jesus Christ has saved us, if we truly believe that what he has done is plucked us from the, the sulfur fire of hell, then we need to allow that to affect how we speak. We need to allow that to affect how we show him to other people. Some of the worst attacks I've ever seen on people are on Facebook pages from Christians. Some of the worst things I've ever seen are people that are just grinding it in to how the government is controlling us, and if you believe them, you are a fool, and all of these things. Guys, what we're, the situation that we're in right now is not normal. I, I agree with you guys. I agree that right now this is weird, it's strange, but let's, let's flip this on its ear for a second. Instead of blaming the government or a fake disease or a real disease or whatever we want to do, let's start looking at the fact that, guys, God uses these times to bring us closer together. He uses this to glorify Him. So how do we do that? Well, we want to get back to church. Can I, can I say something? And, and I've talked to some of our, our lead team and, and Pastor Rob about this. I'm starting in this process of the last few months with Sunday mornings being canceled and different and changed. I'm starting to think that this was a God thing for him to shut down churches for a while. Because what we have on a Sunday morning is idol idolatry. And it's, it's proven when we complain about not being able to sit in this room. It makes this Sunday morning thing all about being in this room. Guys, if we can join in a house church of 10 people, do you realize that there's countries, Egypt, China, places like this, that 10 people would be amazing if they could get together with 10 other believers because if they do, that means that the government isn't watching close enough to where they can come into their house and kill them all for meeting about Jesus. We had the opportunity to do house church, and a lot of us didn't take that opportunity up. We had the opportunity to invite others to our house and, and to fellowship with them, and a lot of us didn't take that up. And so I'm, I'm wondering if God isn't using this time to break us of our idol worship of Sunday morning worship. Because worship doesn't happen on this stage. It doesn't happen in this room. Yes, it does happen in this room, but it's in here. And if it's only able to happen in this room, then we have a wrong perception of what church and what worship look like. And so we need to change. And I believe that God is slowly prying our fingers off of what comfort means because it's comfortable. Uh, most of us in this room have been coming to a Sunday morning service for a long time. A lot of us can't remember not coming to a Sunday morning worship service. Well, guess what? That doesn't mean that you're a Christian. I, I love Keith Green and many other Christians. I'll say this. This is not exclusively a Keith Green comment. It's just the first time I ever heard it. He says, uh, going to a church doesn't make you a Christian, just like going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. It may make you in the shape of a hamburger. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it doesn't make you one. And so, guys, coming to church... And I hope that this breaks some of you guys' bubble a little bit. Coming to church does not mean you are saved. Coming to church does not mean that you are in right standing with Jesus Christ. It's a good start. It's a good, it's a good place to be. I, I would rather you in this room than anywhere else doing some of the things that I know people do outside of this building. But guys, this is not... God isn't going to look at your perfect attendance on a Sunday morning service and be like, Oh, well, come on in. Good job. You did it. Here's your gold star. This does nothing. It's our heart that changes whether or not we are in right standing with Jesus and believing on him and him crucified. And so I want us to preach him and him crucified. I want us to be the people who don't need this building. We don't need this room because guess what? I'm, 
on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm with you guys, hanging out, fellowshipping, talking about the Lord, growing, iron sharpening iron, getting into different, you know, disputes and conversations about the things of God. That's the Christian that I want to be. And that's the Christians I want you guys to be because that's the body working together to grow closer to Jesus Christ. This is just a formality that we do. This is just something that we've been in the habit of doing for hundreds of years. So, guys, that's my soapbox. I'll get off of it. But one, one last final thing on um, being salt. Uh, and, and again, this might cut to the quick a little bit. Being salt does not mean being offensive. Uh, that does not mean that you can be rude. <laughs> We are to flavor. We are to preserve. We are to be the light that shines Jesus Christ. We need to get our minds right and our hearts set back to preaching Christ and Him crucified. Only then will we be effectively preserving our friends, family, and community from these times of great deterioration, of great bacterial infection. And guys, it's all over the place, including the church. Okay. Soapbox done. You guys happy? Good. Okay, so we are to be lights of the world. Now, Jesus here in, in verse 14 sp- says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. So some of you guys may have heard this story. It's an anecdote that a lot of pastors use, but it's a story of little Johnny. And little Johnny is, is brand new Christian, and he's going to go to a summer camp that's not Bible-centered. It is not Bible-focused. And so he goes to his pastor, and he says, Pastor, what do I do? And his pastor says, well, you need to be strong. And they spent, they spent hours praying for Johnny as he goes to this camp to be protected from the world and all these things. So Johnny goes to camp, and he comes back, and the pastor sees him, and he says, little Johnny, how did it go? And Johnny, beaming, says, it went great. And the pastor says, really, did it? And he said, yep, no one found out. Guys, that's hiding our light. <laughs> and so many of us do that as well. There's, there's two ends of this spectrum. One can be in your face and the other one can be like, really, you? I didn't know you were a Christian. Because you hide it so well. Let me tell you about something I never want people to say of me. I never want people to say I'm a cool Christian. Now people say it all the time. Because, I mean, duh. <laughs> but... But guys, I don't want people to say that I'm a cool Christian because that means that in my heart, and this is just me personally, that means that I'm not living the convictions that I want to be living. The convictions that I want to be living are people that are, are affected by Jesus Christ as I come near them. And Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit in other people's lives that are not believers, guys, is a convicting presence. Not a presence of, wow, I would never have guessed that Christians can do that. Ew, I don't want that, guys. And you guys, I've talked about this before. If the line of the world is right here, I want to be as far away from that line as I possibly can be. I don't want to look like the world. I don't want to act like the world. I don't want people to think that I am of the world. I want people to look at me and say, he has something that is so completely different from this world. I want that. Guys, that is the life of a Christian that is, that is living effectively and not hypocritically towards the Lord. Guys, and, and I'm not accusing anybody in here of being a hypocrite, and I'm not going to get down on you for doing the things that you do, but here's the thing is, are you playing with that line? Are you getting a little bit closer to that line? Are you starting to hide the light of Jesus? I, I do this, sorry, I guess I, I hope you guys know what that means. You guys know, like, this little light, I'm, I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to hide it under a bushel. No, like, I'm going to light it and shine. Like, like, so I do this. If, if you guys see me doing the hand motion, sorry. <laughs> I figured you guys would just read my mind. But guys, so many of us are hiding that light, trying to, trying to blend in because we want people to know it's okay to be a Christian and to do these things. It's okay to be a Christian. No, guys, just don't justify. If you have to justify it, there's probably something wrong with it. If you feel like you have to cover your face doing whatever you're doing and, and kind of like, oh, I don't, want, I don't want Pastor Andrew or Pastor Rob to see me here, guess what? You probably shouldn't be there. <laughs> and so, guys, we need to be careful that we are letting our light shine. We aren't meant to hide the light within us. I, the Bible talks about how brightly it is to be shining, and I'm going to list off like a few uh, verses here. So if I go quick too quickly, you can ask me for them later. Um, 
John 8, 12, Acts 13, 47, 1 Peter 2, 9, Ephesians 5, 8, Luke 8, 16, Isaiah 42, 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, Romans 13, 11 through 14, Proverbs 4, 18, and then Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says this, do all things without complaining and disputing. That's interesting. All things. How many things is all things? All things. It's a fascinating word study. All means all. Um, uh, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become uh, blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Sound like us? Uh, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that, I may re- uh, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Paul is talking about, or sorry, uh, yeah, yeah, Paul is talking about um, preaching the gospel to these guys and them living that gospel out. But we are to shine as lights in the darkness. Shining as light. Guys, if you turn off the lights, in, in, not in this room because of these big windows, but if you go into a room with no windows and you turn off all the lights, it's pretty dark, yes? Everybody shake their head, yes. Like None of us have night vision. Um, so if you light up a flashlight, guess what? That flashlight lights up the whole room to some extent. Oh, hey. <laughs> He almost made it. (laughs) It is so close. (laughs) So guys, when you light up that room, the whole room lights up. And so that's how we are supposed to be in this world. The whole world is supposed to be lit up by our light. That means boldness. That means means being willing to be convicted to change. I'm going to say that again. Being willing to be convicted to change. A lot of us sit in our, a lot of you guys were probably sitting in your chairs right now and the Lord was working on it in my heart throughout this week of, yeah, is this really, I mean, come on, like, I'm not, you can't tell me what to do. It's my personal life. Like, it's fine. I'm not hurting anybody. Leave me alone. Guys, I said those things to God, but I, I need to allow him to convict my heart so that I change. Not so that I become legalistic. Or, or become so hard-edged on this that I can't, I can't let anybody else live their life. But I need to be willing to say, ooh, that hurts a little bit, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let God work in me. He's going to mold me. I'm not going to mold myself. We should be lights in the world holding fast the word of life. There is a purpose behind our light shining. And that purpose is God's glory. Not me. People don't go to the person that's holding the flashlight and go, man, you are producing some awesome light. No, they look at the flashlight and say, dang, that's bright. That's what I want it to be. I want people to come up to me and not say, man, you are such a godly man. I'm just so impressed with Jesus in your... No, I want people to say, wow, God has changed you from being a complete idiot into a person that, that is worth a little bit of something. I want that for my life. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want people to be like me. That's for dang sure. Look, this whole series has been about what our purpose is here on this earth. And the main, most important, primary purpose we have is to glorify Him with our lives as a holy and acceptable sacrifice unto the Lord. Guys, is your life a sacrifice? I've said it before. Are you living on a cruise ship or are you living on a battleship? I just finished an epic on Winston Churchill, a huge book on Winston Churchill. That guy made plenty of mistakes, and believe me, he wasn't a Christian. But he lived his life during the war. Guys, I'm just going to, sorry, this is a little history lesson. Side note. Uh, During the war, during the 2,195 days that Britain was in the war, he worked seven days a week and was up until 4.30 in the morning every day and back at work at 8 a.m., That guy had purpose behind what he was doing. He was made for such a time as that. He did it. And he was in his 60s, by the way, during this time. The war ended when he was 70. So guys, are we living as though we are on a battleship? Or are we living as though we are on a cruise ship? On a cruise ship, you get served. You go to the buffet. I don't know, how how many of you guys have been on a cruise before? I've only been on one. And I ate more food on that cruise ship in my life than ever before or since. I think combined. 
So, so guys, you eat a lot on a cruise ship. You play games on a cruise ship. You rock climb, you swim, you do whatever. You go on excursions, and it's all about you. It's self-indulgence on a cruise ship. You get served mimosas on the, on the poop deck. <laughs> poop deck. All right. So, guys, the battleship mentality, have any of you guys ever toured a submarine? No? Have any of you guys ever gone on to, like, a, a battleship cruiser or anything like that? Okay, if you ever go to San Diego, uh, great, great opportunity down there to go, cru uh, you can walk through some of these ships. Guys, a, a submarine specifically is not a comfort ship. <laughs> it is tight quarters, it is hot, it is sweaty, it is stinky, it is miserable. You walk through these things and you have to walk like this, because if you walk like this, you're going gonna to have some marks on your head. And they're, they're not gentle ones, they don't put the little... Uh, the little pool floaties on the, on the upper. No, they don't do that, guys. A, a battleship is, is meant for one purpose, and that is to be in a fight, to be in the war. We are to live our Christians, Christian lives as though we are at war. Paul talks about it very specifically. We don't war against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of, the, of this age, right? Like, we are not fighting a political battle. We are not fighting a COVID battle. We are not fighting anything like that. We are fighting Satan and his armies. And the, what we do is not kill him. We go and save others. In this battle, we are medics. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit like military here. I hope you guys can appreciate that. We are medics in this battle. We go and save people away from the enemy. And guys, don't get me wrong in my, in my, you know, wordage. We don't save anybody. We just do the work. God saves people. So here's the thing, guys, is how are you living your life? Just take, take a, a second here and just think about, am I living my life, my Christian walk? Is it a cruise ship or is it a battleship? Am I, enjoy, am I expecting God or, or my pastors or the people around me to feed me? Like, stick the funnel in and shove the food in, and great, thanks, I'm, I'll survive for this week. Or am I going out, getting prepared, and fighting the war that we, are, we have been put in? That's where we're supposed to be. That's the people who will hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. A lot of us, guys, haven't earned rest. <laughs> A lot of us have sat on our cruise ship, and we've enjoyed being fed. And so, guys, we need to be the lights of the world that shine brightly, that change people, that, that go and preach Christ and Him crucified. In all honesty, if, if, if this was a church that preached who to vote for, I wouldn't be a part of it. Because I don't, I don't care who you vote for. I, I think that there are some some issues that we need to pray through for sure, but it's not my job as, as your pastor or one of your pastors to tell you guys who to vote for. My job is to preach Christ in Him crucified. Sorry, that's my, uh, that's to test my blood sugar, sorry. My job is to preach Christ in Him crucified. My job is to preach the Word of God. You guys can stand before God when you go to tell Him who you voted for. I'm not going to be there. You guys can make that decision based on your convictions, based on your heart, based on what's going on with God in your life. That's not my... So I really don't care if you believe what I believe politically. I really... It's not even something that I care to talk about with most of you guys. There are a few certain select people that are close enough in my life that I talk to about those things. But guys, we should be preaching Christ and Him crucified to the world as a whole. And here's what social media has ruined for us is we can have our opinion in three seconds and we can have 500 other opinions that agree with us and one person feels left out and attacked so they have to be loud and come back. And it turns into a fight. So I'm going to wrap this up now. And in that, we're going to be talking about what we can do moving forward to be lights in this world. Look, it's not our job to make our opinions known. And I, I know that I've hammered that home. I want to hammer it home one more time. It's not you guys' job to make your opinions known. 
It's not our place to make our opinions known. Because as dead men and women, we have none. It's Jesus' opinion. It's Christ's opinion of our lives. You guys have heard us say this before, and we're going to say it more and more. We should be praying for those that we, that we disagree with. If politically you can't handle someone that you don't like, guess what? Pray for them. Don't post about them on Facebook. Don't, don't tweet about them or, or read books about how terrible of a person they are. Pray for them. Pray for your pastors, guys. We are going through a time that is unprecedented in our history of we've never had to go through this kind of a thing before. Because the last time it was was 100 years ago, and as old of a community as we have, there's not many people that remember the Spanish flu. So guys, we haven't gone through this before, so pray for us because we are having to make decisions on the fly that affect the entire congregation. We need your prayers. We covet your prayers. Please pray for us. Pray for your lead team. If you don't know who your lead team is in the bulletin, you can find out who your lead team is. If you still don't know who your lead team is or you don't want to go online to get a bulletin, come and ask us. We'll tell you who they are and you can pray for them. Pray for their hearts as they lead this church. Guys, pray for the people that you disagree with most. The people who you agree with, guess what? They're okay. They're fine. They're in your boat. Great. Good. They don't need a ton of your prayers. The people who you disagree with are the people who you need to be praying for. And don't pray that they would change and get right. Pray that you would change and understand their point of view. Guys, allow God to change you. It is a good thing to be changed by the Holy Spirit. I challenge you all to make this this week. Not even just this week. For the rest of your lives. <laughs> because a lot of times a week isn't long enough. Use your social media platforms to glorify Jesus. Use your social media platforms and your, the, the platform that you have at your job to glorify Him. Don't post about the politics. Don't, guess what? It'll all be there next year or next election or next whatever else. It'll all be there. Don't post about those things. Talk about the things that matter, which is Christ and Him crucified. That Jesus Christ, the God-man, came down from heaven to live a perfect life, to give us the example that we should follow, to die on a cross, because as a perfect sacrifice, Him dying on a cross can cover and wash away our sins. And three days later, He rose again to show that He conquered death and that he, what He said is true. And if you believe in him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, then you will be saved. There is nothing else that you have to do. There's no works that you have to do. There's nothing else. You are good. You will be saved if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so do that. Preach him, Christ and him crucified. If you guys say that you don't know, guess what? You can't claim ignorance anymore because I just told you what Christ and him crucified is. That is the message that we as a Christian church should be preaching. That is the message that we as a Christian church should be proclaiming to all the world. Not this COVID stuff. Not this political stuff. We should be preaching Christ and Him crucified. And guys, hold me accountable to it. I invite you all to hold me accountable to it. If I ever stop preaching Christ and Him crucified, you get me off this stage as fast as possible. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much, Lord, that you have given us not just eternal life and, and salvation from hell, but Lord, you've given us a relationship with the God of the universe who loves us more than anything else in this world. It doesn't make sense. Lord, we can't buy it. We can't, we can't do anything, Lord. We just bring our filthy, dirty rags to your feet and we say, Lord, here I am. Lord, I pray for that person who is confused with all of the things in this world as, as noise, as, as just static, Lord. I pray for them to have clarity of mind in this moment that they would reach out to you and that they would hold on tight. Lord, as, they, as we talk about what it means to be a body of believers that shines our light brightly, as we talk about being salt of the earth, 
Lord, I pray that every single person's heart in this room right now would be crushed for the things that break your heart. Lord, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Let us look on sin and despise it and run towards you. Let us look on this world and deny it and run towards you. Lord, help us to die to ourselves. Help us to run to you. And Lord, help us to remain faithful to you in the hard times. We love you so much, and we just ask that your presence would be with us this week, this month, this year, as we go forward every single days of our life in the hurting, in the struggles, in the pain, in the sorrows. I pray that you would be the joy that fills up our hearts. We love you so much, God. We thank you and we praise you in your name. Amen.